Welcome to a special edition of the School Transportation Nation podcast. I'm Ryan Gray, Editor-in-Chief of School Transportation News. This episode brought to you here in Indianapolis at the STN Expo Indy by TransFinder, the leader in school bus routing, Cummins, powering customers through innovation and dependability, and by School Radio, your source for reliable radio communications. And right off the bat, we're going to start with an ad from Cummins. I got a message from Cummins, powering customers through innovation and dependability. Cummins is the school bus powertrain leader with more than a century of innovation and the experience you can depend on. Cummins can meet your sustainability power needs no matter where you are on the path to zero emissions. Whether it's advanced diesel and renewable fuels or battery electric or hydrogen fuel cell, customers trust Cummins to have the right solution. With the launch of Accelera, they're accelerating to shift to zero emission vehicles by pursuing the most promising technologies, not betting on a single path, but developing an array of cutting edge solutions. Learn more at Cummins.com. That's Cummins.com. As I mentioned, we're on site here at the STN Expo in Indianapolis. And I'm joined by our very special guest, Brittany Barrett from the World Resources Institute, Senior Manager of School District E-Mobility Technical Assistance. It's a mouthful. It is. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Now, you're going to be on a panel with us where we're talking about uh, challenges with electric school bus implementation and scaling up. First of all, uh, let's talk about technical assistance to, for school districts. Now, what in... What in heavens could they need assistance with? <laughs> oh, just a couple of things. Um, so the World Resources Institute has an electric school bus initiative. We have a team of people um, that are working with different stakeholders in the electric school bus ecosystem. And we try and be uh, a non-biased source for school districts and contractors um, in their transition to electric school buses. So we uh, do a number of things, including one-on-one -on -one meetings with school districts. We run working groups. We produce a ton of resources that are completely free that help with every aspect of the transition process. Excellent. So, and, and obviously the, when I mentioned that the session that you're on here, uh, you're bringing that perspective. So we have a couple school districts uh, who have varying degrees of um, experience with, with electric school buses, and now you're, you're going to be giving the national perspective. So uh, in terms of that, what are some of the, the biggest needs that you're hearing from school districts in terms of that technical assistance? Sure. A, a big piece of it is just the resource of time. Um, you know, school districts are trying to do a lot of things at the same time. Um, and so we just want to be there to help bring together best practices um, that are going on. So we talk to school districts who have been going through this process for years and uh, or brand new to it and try and um, convey like what some of those challenges were um, so that other school districts don't necessarily have to repeat the same mistakes and can learn from the best ways to do it. And and one of your other hats that you wear for WRI, you're the acting senior manager for strategy and manufacturing engagement. So you're obviously very involved with the OEMs and trying to bridge some of that knowledge gap, perhaps, for, for the school districts? Yeah, we've um, run a steering committee group with the OEMs, both for the school buses themselves and the charging infrastructure, talking to them about some of the challenges that school districts are passing along that they're experiencing, understanding what's going on um, in the OEM world, challenges, and workforce development is also um, another topic that we talk about with them. Absolutely. So workforce development, that's something I did want to talk to you about before we talk a little bit about the EPA Clean school bus program because obviously we have the competitive grant out right now august 22nd the deadline so school districts are fast and furious trying to wrap their heads around that and and we can talk about some of those big differences between the year one rebate so in terms of workforce development uh, that has been a big issue and something that's very big on wri's uh, wish list notice that epa does address that with the competitive grant but it's not maybe not weighed as much um, as some would like to see. Um, what are you hearing from districts that you're talking to? What are, what are their biggest needs that they're looking for to help with workforce de development? Is it their mechanics? Is it their drivers? Is it both? Yeah, I think from a, a school district perspective or even a contractor perspective, um, there's just a lot of questions about it. 
Uh, most of these buses, they're going to be brand new. They're going to be under warranty. So the dealers will be taking care a lot of the maintenance on them in the beginning if there is maintenance to be done, which I think gives a lot of uh, opportunity to get the training for the workforce in place. The drivers definitely, you know, the how the driver operates the vehicle and their efficiency with using the regenerative braking will make a huge difference in the range they see in those batteries. Um, so I think that kind of training definitely needs to be done up front. But I, um, there's a lot of the uh, maintenance portion of this that can be done by your existing workforce. And then the more technical high voltage aspects of it, you, you can get the training, you can work with your dealer. Most of the OEMs are saying um, when they're delivering the vehicles that they're providing you know, a at least a basic level of training. So that's coming. The other side of it is the training for the chargers and the maintenance needed on those. So that's you know a another conversation conversation as well. Absolutely. And in terms of the utilities, so I know that uh, EPA has um, initiated further work, I, I guess I'll put it that way, with trying to bridge that gap with utilities and the school districts. Because that's one of the number one things we hear, right? Infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. Here are some of the conversations at STN Expo Indy. Folks have been vocalizing what we've been talking about for a while. It does you no good if you get a uh, you know, however much money from the EPA clean school bus program to get electric school buses, if they're just going to sit there because you don't have the infrastructure, right? Is WRI seeing anything developing so far with that relationship? I know EPA just announced it a little bit ago, but what does that, what does that look like? What's WRI um, seeing kind of in the tea leaves in terms of trying to bridge that gap between utilities and school districts? Yeah, I think that is the number one area where we encourage school districts to even before you start looking at the school buses, have you spoken to your utility representative? Um, have you spoken to them about the capacity that you'll need? Which depots can you electrify first? How many buses can you put in from the beginning? Um, I think in this round of the Clean School Bus Program, there's actually a letter that needs to be included that you have at least had a conversation with your utility and that you're uh, they're aware that you're going to be you know pursuing electrification. So that can, you know, make or break the process. We have seen school districts get buses delivered and there is no charging infrastructure in place for them yet. So that, you know, that doesn't look great to have those, those new vehicles there. Well, I think we're going to take a break right now and get a message from our friends at TransFinder. Guys, have you ever seen a car commercial? They're always saying that the new model is sportier, faster, better. Well, the folks at TransFinder say that's the way to look at their new and improved Service Finder solution. It has the same name, but everything about the new Service Finder is better faster, sleeker, more intuitive. Service Finder is the next generation of fleet and asset management software. It's browser-based and will make your fleet productive and cost-effective. Service Finder reduces burdensome paperwork, tracks your costs, and will help keep you from missing critical repairs. Let's face it, buses aren't cheap. You need to keep them running efficiently and lasting longer to get the most out of your investment. To learn more about Service Finder, visit transfinder.com or email them at marketing at transfinder.com or give them a call at 800 373 3609. That's 800 373 3609. So, back with Brittany Barrett of WRI, let's talk now about the EPA Clean School Bus Program. So I mentioned earlier, we do have the competitive grant out right now. A uh, lot of differences between year one. So it's $400 million that's available in this pot of money. It's a competitive grant. You know, so there is a, a lot more um, work that's needed to be done on that application process. Can you take our, our listeners through a little bit what is different between now and then? Sure, absolutely. So yes, it is more work, but there's also more opportunity. In this round, it's a minimum of 15 buses, a maximum of 50 for an individual school district. Um, and if you're a contractor or go in with multiple school districts, you can get up to 100 buses. So that's a great opportunity. But with 400 million, that means a lot fewer applications are going to be awarded. So it's going to be highly competitive. Um, the points um, that are used for the scoring are broken down in the um, notice of funding, um, but there's a, a, a big chunk, 20 of the, I think, 120 total points are given for priority districts. So 
Um, if you're on the EPA's priority list, you already get you know a basis of 20 points there for that. What's also different this time is there um, for the electric school buses, there's $395,000 total for the charging infrastructure, the hardware and the buses, and it doesn't say how you have to split that up. But on top of that, this time around, you can put in budget for other pieces of it, like trainers or consultants to help you look at evaluating your routes or solar infrastructure. So there's no cap on the max that you can request with the eligible budget items. So that's really interesting and different this time. Um, and for school districts that are going to have a competitive grant, you know, this is the way to go for that, to get those extra things. Because the rebate, it was just the bus and the chargers. So this lets you budget in all those other extra costs this time around. There is also the opportunity to get points for bringing in leveraged funds. So it's not a requirement. You don't have to bring anything to the table. But if you do bring leverage, you can get up to an additional 15 points. Leverage funds doesn't have to mean cash. It can mean in-kind services that have a dollar value. So if your utility is going to put in some of the charging infrastructure piece that's on behind the meter um, and you know bring that to the grant, that counts as leverage funds. If your dealer is going to do workforce development training for you, that can count as leveraged funds. So there's a lot of opportunity um, with that as well. I'm trying to think what are some of the other opportunities in, in this round. Um, Repowers are still not eligible this round, but the same um, requirements and specs for the vehicles are there. It's got to be a gross vehicle weighting of 10,000 plus for that. And um, there's different levels for the different size vehicles. So there's the, the the main ones off the top of my head. And one, and one of the big uh, aspects or differences too is just the application process, right? It's going to take a lot longer. Yeah, so it's a narrative. Um, they the EPA did give a, a word document that you can download that has all the um, the different components to it. WRI is actually creating a template um, that is kind of pre filled with some of the information in tips and suggestions for how to complete things. Template letters because you need to get um, letters of support from partners. We have links to resources. There's calculations you need to do for your emissions reductions. Um, so it, it is going to take a little bit more effort, but the reward is bigger because you can get up to 50 buses this time. So if you're ready to scale your fleet, this is the opportunity for you. So where can folks find those resources uh, that you mentioned from WRI? Uh, it's electricschoolbusinitiative.org is okay. our website. Um, and all of our tools and resources are on there. We have total cost of ownership calculators. Um, we have a power planner for working with your utility and the kinds of questions you want to walk through in order to have a discussion with your utility. Um, we have vignettes um, that we post that interview different school districts from all kinds of operating environments, cold weather, hot weather, so that you can see you know, how electric school buses are operating across the U.S. and in Canada, actually, as well. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So in terms of uh, the 15 buses that you mentioned, or I guess the minimum of 15 buses, uh, really, you know, one of the things that jumped out to me when I saw this was in the rebate, it was the kind of the onesies and twosies, right? Getting some districts or tribal um, organizations, getting their feet wet with electric. Seems that right, you know, right now, now they're really trying to push some of those maybe fleets that have already established. Obviously, you, California comes to mind, right? Um, as one of those that, that has had some electric at least more established uh, for the last, you know, several years. What are you at Art and WRI looking at in terms of that scaling? So uh, there's been a lot of conversation with, okay, folks are getting their feet wet. They've had, they maybe been operating electric school buses for a couple of years. Now, how do they go about best scaling successfully to start increasing the number of electric buses that are coming in? Yeah, we've seen ESBs in pilot mode for a while, and I think this really helps move it to that that scaling strategy. Um, at, at this point, it's where school districts really need to make sure they have a plan and understand the charging side of things, understanding demand charges and using managed charging to make sure that they're not you know, getting extra bills that they did not expect, and understanding... Um, each of their routes and how much battery capacity they need and how long they can run without the charging so that they can avoid midday charging um, and just do it overnight. 
Um, and then, you know, the upgrades to the depots are more likely to be needed when you have this many vehicles charging at one time. And there's a lot more options in terms of, do you use a DC fast charger with multiple outlets? Uh, do you do a one-to-one -one with your level two chargers? Um, so there's a lot more consideration. Uh, we call we, looking at like a decision tree and thinking long term. You know, s preparing for those uh, future uh, scaling and growth opportunities and being prepared to make decisions for that now. So it's, it it requires a lot more thought into it than just getting one and trying it out. Yeah. And and the impact of those decisions, right? Because we're hearing now, we're knowing now that DC fast chargers um, that could determine, you know, less range or or more cycles on the batteries. Talking about batteries, I know you guys are doing a lot of research on batteries right now. One of the, the big uh, conversations has been cost. And there's been talk that batteries are coming down. Now, the past year, we saw them spike along with a lot of other things, right? With inflation, supply chain. What are you seeing at WRI right now in terms of battery technology, battery costs, specifically for the school bus audiences? Sure. So we've done a lot on price tracking for vehicles, the ESBs and regular school buses um, in general. And when you compare across all fuel types, prices have been going up um, across the board. So it's not just ESBs. Um, I think, you know, you talked about scale um, for the clean school bus program. I think we're seeing OEMs scaling up their production capabilities. I think um, Bluebird just brought another plant online. Lions opened theirs. Um, Green Power just opened a new facility, BYD in California. So they're all growing and getting to that scale, I think, will help bring down the costs for all the components overall. On the battery side, um, a lot of what we've been looking at is considerations for costs for that end of life use, for the for the end, you know, thinking very far down the line when these batteries need to be replaced in, you know, nobody knows for sure, but about eight years probably um, what can be done because they still have about 75 percent capacity. So it's not enough to run a bus, but you mm -hmm. could do other things with it. So looking at recycling or second life use considerations and who's responsible for those costs, who owns that, um, what organizations are uh, stood up and ready to handle that. So that that's a lot of what we're looking at considering, you know, the full life cycle of the batteries and mm -hmm. the impact that they have. And this was a question I posed to you a, a week ago, I think, in, in email. You, we, were, we were kind of chatting back and forth about this. And I, I said, well, what does our audience need to know about that second life, that recycling? Because I know that there are projects ongoing right now, the Department of Energy, um, there's private industry involved. Why do student transportation leaders need to understand and look at the battery second life? Um, because when they get to the end of their useful life, the owner is going to be responsible for doing something with those batteries. And it's not going to be the same as when you're done with your internal combustion engine vehicle. So understanding, do you need to negotiate with your OEM up front on who's responsible for that? Does it need to be in your RFP that there's a recycling pl plan in place? Because you know those can be a lot of um, extra costs that school districts may not be expecting at the end of, of that. So we want them to be prepared and considering that on the front end. This might be too early to know fully, but this is a question that I have. Is there a potential marketplace um, in terms of Second Life, because we're hearing so much of obviously of the cost of the, you know, a lot of grants right now are covering most of that. Um, but we, when we're talking about revenue, a lot of the promise is V to G, and mm -hmm. that's been what's in the national press. I think uh, folks that are operating the electric school buses know that V to G. There's some potential issues there. It's not ready for prime time, and even if it was, there's some other impacts it can have on that battery life. So. You know, I would like to hear a little bit more potentially on what folks also need to think about in terms of that as a revenue stream, that that recycling. Yeah. So in terms of the battery, the second life use stationary storage. So if you pair it with solar, you could store energy and then use that to charge your new buses. So there's potential there. Um, it can be integrated some uh, charging uh, companies are using stationary storage batteries so you can charge those up when the costs for the, the electricity is low, and then you are able to charge anytime you want and not worry about those demand charges. So there's some of that um, marketplace coming online. About 60% of the cost 
associated with recycling or the second life use right now is in the transportation of the batteries. So it's got to be a more local solution mm -hmm. to help cut down on that. In terms of V to G, I, I would agree. I think WRI is seeing it as a nascent te technology, um, but with potential. We've you know highlighted several case studies where it's happening in Cajon Valley in California. Um, Montgomery County, Maryland. Um, so there's definitely potential, but like you said, I think there's still some technological um, hurdles for it to be as smooth that anybody can implement. But it, it is something that school districts need to think about because there are choices they need to make in the beginning um, that are going to enable them to even consider that in terms of the capacity of the battery and the types of chargers that they're buying in the first place. And you mentioned the case studies. I mentioned earlier a lot of the research that WRI has done. You can also go and find a lot of those case studies and research on the website, correct? Yes, they're all there. Same same website, yep. electric, electric school bus initiative org. Electric school bus initiative org. So in terms of that research, what's the latest and greatest or what's WRI looking to research next? Can you give us a look under the hood or... Sure. So um, we just released um, a couple of articles in the past few days. We have a um, all about SLAs, service level agreements, so school districts can understand, you know, outside of warranties, how do you negotiate service level uptimes for your chargers and for the buses themselves? Because we want to make sure school districts are having good experiences and not hearing, oh, the bus was sitting for months and had to be repaired. So, you know, how do you address that on the front end with with your OEMs and your dealers? We also just published a total cost of ownership calculator. So that's OEM agnostic and allows you to plug in all the information in terms of your electricity rates. Is it diesel? Is it propane? Um, all of those. Another piece of research that we're working on has to do with what is the impact in terms of GHG and children's health um, associated with all of these improvements. So hoping to have an article out very shortly, uh, really quantifying that and helping um, people to see the value of that in terms of numbers. Uh, we've done a lot on the policy side, um, you know, outside of the clean school bus program funding at the federal level. Many states have started stepping up and putting in mandates, but also putting funding behind that. New York, New Jersey, Colorado, California, all have money that's going to be available um, for electric school buses uh, in addition to the federal funds. Excellent. Well, Brittany, you know, a wealth of information there. I'm just starting to scratch the surface, really. So definitely um, go over on to electricschoolbusinitiative.org. That's and right. And there's lots of information there. Of course, stnonline.com. Brittany, thanks again. WRI has been a great partner to us here at STN. We appreciate having you here at the conference and many more. Thanks so much for having me. This was great. Thanks again to Brittany from WRI for joining the podcast. We also appreciate, as always, our episode sponsors, TransFinder, Cummins, and School Radio. Visit stnonline.com for all the STN Expo Indianapolis coverage. And guess what, folks? In just a few weeks, we're going to be in Reno, STN Expo Reno. So stay tuned for that. Hope to see you there. We'll leave you now with a message from School Radio. Hey guys, is reliable radio and communications important to you? Got a message from School Radio. The laws against using cell phones while operating commercial vehicles are in place for the safety and security of both your school bus drivers and your students. Taking that risk comes with a hefty fine, penalties, and even the disqualification of the CDL of the driver. School Radio specializes in providing wide area, push to talk, two way radio solutions for schools and school transportation that are fully compliant with all hands free operational laws. They offer a managed service program, which includes the device, all services, all maintenance at a fixed monthly budget point. No expense infrastructure or FCC license is required. Get a demo today by visiting school-radio.com. That's school-radio.com.